Wow. Well, today um, we are starting, uh, we had before COVID, we had um, a service on Main Street. It was called Recover Church. And we had a recovery ministry that grown, that grew so much that we turned it into a church. And so um, it was awesome. Uh, right before we started it a year before COVID, uh, just in that year, we had uh, 125 salvations. We baptized 66 in a water trough. And so we're starting it back again today uh, at Praise Center Church. They're allowing us to use their fellowship hall. And so if you are interested in coming, it's a two o'clock service at Praise Center. We also have some flyers. There's just a few left. If you're interested in helping or serving, being a part, uh, we would appreciate it. And if nothing else, you could pray for our Recover Church. It is a dynamic ministry to uh, address hurts, habits, and hangups, which is about all of us. And so uh, we, we live in a world where the enemy knows his time is short. He goes after people. And uh, we are here to see that people get set free in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you get your outline out with me this morning, we're talking about setting the captives free. And I want you to look with me to Luke chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 18 and 19 this morning. And it says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And the reason on your outline it's uh, bolded is because it's a prophecy from Isaiah that is fulfilled in the life of Christ. And so we see here that it's presented to us what Jesus' ministry was. It was to preach the gospel to the poor or those who were poor in spirit, the humble, those who were crushed in spirit, to heal the brokenhearted, to bring deliverance to the captives, open the spiritual eyes of the blind, those blinded by the world, Satan, and our own lust, that we may see the truth of God's freedom and salvation and um, be free from Satan's domain of fear, guilt, and sin to be set free. Well, there are, we've talked about before how when we set out to follow Jesus, the enemy of our soul is right there to try to distract us away from the things of the Lord. And so um, when, when we're dealing with the recovery church, we're talking about a, a, a lot of uh, addictions. There's alcohol, drugs, uh, pornography, uh, gluttony, and the list goes on. And all the things that the enemy tries to uh, get us trapped in. If you're in your kitchen, you can notice that you may have an electric can opener, you can have an electric uh, toaster, you can have an electric stove or refrigerator. All of those are different um, appliances, but they find their power from the same source, electricity. So all those addictions that the enemy tries to get people in, they are coming from the same source regardless of the trap. So they all come from the same source, which is Satan, who tries to get us in a place that is far from the Lord. Because how many of you know when we're doing those things that are wrong, we don't feel victorious in the Lord. We don't feel like being spiritual. We don't feel like being close to the Lord, right? Because the darkness does not like to be exposed to the light. And so the outcome is enslavement, if you will, uh, to evil, brokenheartedness, bondage, addictions, spiritual blindness, and physical distress. And these are the things that people get trapped of in the world today. The Bible calls these strongholds, where the enemy tries to get strongholds in each one of us, and everyone is susceptible to these things. That's why I believe this message is so important. You've heard me talk about different traps that the enemy tries to put. Like I say, if you're going to catch a, a rat, you put a bait in the trap, right? Does it, does it seem like it's a trap to a rat? No. And so the same thing as the enemy puts traps to us, it does not seem like a trap, but he gets a lot of people because he, he appeals to the senses. And so sometimes even as Christians, we can find 
that sometimes those strongholds can get a hold of us. And that's why, again, this message is so important. So look what it says in Romans chapter 7. It says this, verses 14 through 18. He says this, and I have this in a new application translation. It says, the trouble is not with the law, but with me. Because I am sold into slavery with sin as my master. I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I know perfectly well that what I'm doing is wrong, and my bad conscience shows that I agree with the law, is, that the law is good. But I can't help myself because it is sin inside me that makes me do these evil things. I know I am rotten through and through so far as my old sin, sinful nature is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do what is right. I want to, but I can't. So this is the Apostle Paul, and I believe this is talking about his, his pre-conversion self, that there is a huge wrestle with the flesh, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Have you ever been there before? Yeah. And so there, there's a, a, an application of, of the flesh here that we, we see. And he's, uh, again, describing the wrestle before he gets to chapter 8. And so in this text, he's not depending upon God's grace and mercy and strength through faith, He's relying on the flesh. Now, when I read that, that really applies to everybody who's in addiction because they know it's wrong, they don't want to do it, and the very thing they hate, they find themselves doing. And so um, we see here in this text that the old sinful nature, he says before, that we need to get rid of that old sinful nature. He says it again in different texts, we need to get rid of the old man. And I used the illustration before that back in Paul's day, when he's talking about put to death the old man, get rid of the old man, he's saying this in the context, if somebody in Paul's day committed murder, they would take the old body and they would strap it on the guy who was alive. And that was his sentence, that he would have to carry around the old man. What happens after a couple days? And then what happens after a couple weeks? Decay, right? And the decay of the old man gets into the live man, and that decay eats him alive, and he dies. And that's the context that Paul says we need to get rid of the old man. Now, talking about your husband, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> talking about our fleshly selves. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, um, we see that, that there is a struggle. There is a struggle. Here the enemy tries to get strongholds in us, and um, what we read in Romans chapter 7, he says, that we are a slave, and he says, and your master is sin. He doesn't call it a problem. He doesn't call it a struggle. He doesn't call it a mistake. He calls it a sin master. You're not just making the same mistake over and over and over again. You have a master because you don't know. If you don't know the cause, you won't be able to find the cure. So the cause that sinful nature that we deal with, um, as we deal with this sinful um, man, uh, we need to find the cure. So the cure is that sinful nature. And what happens if you don't know the right cause, you'll be medicating the wrong cause, which is what people do. And it can be a gateway to other things. So here in 2 Corinthians Three through five, it says this. We are human. In the King James, it says flesh. We are human, but we don't wage war with human plans and methods. For we use God's mighty weapons, not mere 
worldly weapons to knock down the devil's strongholds. With these weapons, we break down every proud argument that keeps people from knowing God. What keeps people from knowing God? It says here, we break down every proud argument that keeps people from knowing God. So if you were to look in the King James, that proud argument would say lofty thoughts. It would uh, say different speculations. Here it says proud arguments. So what happens is that the devil gets these strongholds in our mind, and that word there, uh, proud arguments or lofty thoughts or speculation, is the word that's synonymous with partitions. Now, if you go to one of our rooms, room 13, it's a large room. There would be these big accordion that were very good insulated, and we would close the two things. They were lofty, meaning they went high to the ceiling all the way down to the floor. You could open and close them. And so they're, de they're designed that the room is so big, if you want to have two classrooms, you take the, partici the partitions and you close them, and then you divide the room. So it's designed that somebody can have a meeting over here, somebody can have a meeting over here, and if you're having a meeting over here, the conversation and the words don't penetrate over here. So that's what the enemy tries to do, is he tries to put proud arguments, self arguments, speculations that the enemy tries to raise up against the knowledge of God. And so in the context of this, um, we see that you have two classrooms at the same time. The same space as you close it that is divided. And so the reason you divide it is so the information again, stays on one side. So what Paul is saying in this text is the reason we stay defeated is because the partition in our mind. There is a blockage in the mind. It's a speculation and thoughts and proud arguments that partition up against the knowledge of God. Now the Bible calls it, and this is kind of the definition of it, a double-minded man. That means you're thinking of two things at the same time. He says, don't expect to get anything because you're doing two things at one time. You're living in the flesh and you're trying to walk in the spirit. Doesn't work, does it? So that's what he does. He raises up a partition so you have, you have partly things of God and you have partly things of the world. And you're a double-minded man. And so, um, wow, it keeps people from knowing God. So the enemy is then able to keep the truth of God from infiltrating your whole being. And it's called the devil's strongholds. So the enemy of our soul wants you to be thinking two different things at the same time. Well, you can go to church on Sunday as long as there's room for your other thoughts on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And so there's a competition there between the spirit and the flesh. It's like my brother, I go to Texas, and he takes me to a city called Fredericksburg, Texas. Now, you can't go to Texas without having Texas barbecue. So he takes me to this barbecue place. It's a great place. I mean, it's good stuff. Ribs and brisket. Anyway. So my brother's there, and, and he's, he's looking there. He goes, man, he goes, I'll, I'll have some of that brisket. And he goes, hey, can I have some of that fat there on, on the side? I go, oh, yeah. The guy says, oh, yeah, I can, I can take that. And he puts it on his plate extra. He says, no charge. He goes, we'll just get rid of it anyway. You could have it. So then he goes, hey, what's that? He goes, oh, that's a homemade potato salad. He goes, well, put a scoop of that on my, on my plate. And he goes, hey, we got some great cheesy macaroni and cheese. You'll love it. He goes, yeah, give me some of that. Then he gets what's called Texas toast. You ever seen Texas toast? It's like four inches of toast, and they put a little garlic butter on it. And so he, got, he, he has his plate full. He goes to the end of the line. He goes, I'll have a Diet Pepsi. 
And I started laughing at him. He goes, what are you laughing at? I go, you have all this fat, all these carbs, all this, and what, you're going to even it out with a Diet Pepsi. Real good. <laughs> but it makes him feel better. Because he orders a Diet Pepsi. And let me just say this. People get all kinds of fleshly carbs. <laughs> Get all kinds of these things, all this, but we're going to wash it away with a diet church or a diet worship. Oh, but I feel better about myself, right? And so, could you imagine incorporating all the worldliness and all the flesh of the week, and then we go to church and we think, hey, we're going to. We're going to get rid of all that stuff. And he says, no, all that stuff is raising it up against the knowledge of God. So listen, in order to have God's truth to bring victory over the devil's strongholds, over slavery to sin, that wall or that partition must be taken down. Let me say that again. That partition of our thinking to think of the flesh and then try to live in the spirit, it doesn't quite work, does it? And so to take that stronghold down, it has to be destroyed. You will never have victory with a divided wall, with a divided mind. Write this on your outline. The flesh can't fix the flesh. He says that. He goes, we are flesh, but we don't wage war of the flesh. And so... We try to fix it with the flesh. Any of you try to fix your flesh with the flesh? Okay, it's New Year's resolution. I'm going to lose 15 pounds. You know what happens? I gain seven. <laughs> but I'm trying in the flesh. I'm trying to fix the flesh. Well, I'm going to do this in the flesh. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I pull a Dr. Phil and say, how does that work for you? It doesn't, right? Because the, fit, the flesh can't fix the flesh. It has to be something of a change of heart, a change of mind, which changes our attitude. So look what he says here in John 8, 31. If you continue in my word, say word, then you are true disciples, and you will know the truth, say truth, and the truth will set you free. So we're to know the truth because it is the truth that sets us free. You're only going to be free by the truth. Not what you believe the truth to, to be. Again, somebody said, well, uh, Pastor Brown, I got my own truth. And then I say, okay, how's that working for you? Because truth is the absolute standard by which reality is measured. Let me say that again. Truth is the absolute standard by which reality is measured. If you have a mathematical truth, it would go something like this. One plus one is two. You guys are brilliant. Half of you pass the test. Let me try it again. One plus one is two. It's a mathematical equation, right? And it shows us the standard of truth. So you can say, well, I identify as a three. Well, you can identify as a three all you want. The truth is still one plus one is two, right? You can identify as a four, five, or six, but it's still two. It's a mathematical truth. And so the truth is what sets us free. Now, the enemy tries to get all kinds of people in delusions of what the truth is. In our world today, what is true is not true, and what is false seems to be true, right? It's an upside down. It's, it's, a, it's totally the enemy that we see in um, the Garden of Eden. What is right is wrong. What is wrong is right. And we're seeing it more and more in our world today. So I have to continually take down that wall in my mind, the partition that the enemy tries to put up against the knowledge of God. I got to be mindful and take it down that I have one mind that is filled with the Spirit, right? Because if I'm filled with the Spirit, I will not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. So, 
So you have to conform to the truth. What is the truth? One plus one is two. We conform to that truth. Truth is where reality is revealed. Now look with me at Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. He says, throw off your old evil nature. In other words, that old man, get rid of that. Throw off your old evil nature and your former way of life, which is rotten through and through, full of lust and deception. Instead, there must be a spiritual renewal of your thoughts and attitudes. You must display a new nature because you are a new person created in the likeness, righteousness, holy and true. If you were to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we left out verse 5 there, but he basically says we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so sometimes we can get evil thoughts. Any of you have ever get an evil thought? I'm the only one? Oh, okay, a few of you. And so what we have to do, the enemy wants to plant those negative thoughts in us, to be negative, to wake up negative, to go to bed negative, to live negative, and put all these thoughts in our, our minds that appeal to our flesh. And the Bible says, take them captive to the obedience of Christ. So if you're getting a negative thought, if you're getting something that's not godly, you've got to get rid of it. Because if not, it will build up a wall. So you have to, you heard me say a thousand times that I wrap it up like a gunny sack. I wrap it up and toss it out. I take those negative thoughts captive, not to ponder on them, but to toss them out. And it's a great exercise. So if you ever see me doing this while I'm driving, that's what I'm doing. And so I lost three pounds by this process. Anyway, I'm starting a new movement. The exercise of taking your thoughts captive. Anyway. And then he says this in Romans 8. So in Romans 7, he's talking about the flesh. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Here in 8, he says, therefore, based upon my flesh, based upon my desires that I can't control, therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? So there... Back then, he was talking about the law. He goes, I prove that I, I think the law is good because I feel guilty, and my guilt shows that I'm feeling the law and I approve of the law, otherwise I wouldn't feel guilty. And then here he says, now there's no condemnation. So, again, the law is given. The law is there. The Bible says the law is good in every way, yet it cannot save. But there's perfection of the law. The law is perfect. Yet it cannot save, he says. Jesus comes as a fulfillment of the law. He comes as a fulfillment of everything that is righteous and holy and good and pure. Fulfills it in his life. And then he dies on the cross. In other words, he's condemned of our sin upon himself. So then Paul says... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How many of you are in Christ Jesus? You're not condemned because Jesus was condemned for us. So that condemnation is not for us. For the law of the spirit of life is Christ Jesus has set you free from the law and of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it is, was through the flesh God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who are accord with the flesh set their minds of the things of the flesh but those who are in accord with the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. So the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. He has death for you. The Lord has life for us. 
Where the spirit is, there's life. Where there is the flesh and we dwell on that, there is the spiritual death that takes place and sometimes a physical death. In Romans 8, 12, he says this, so then, brothers and sisters, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according with the flesh, you are going to die, but if you, but if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. To master the truth, I have to abide in the truth. Then truth is my master. And the truth will set you free. In Hebrews 4.12, he says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of of the soul and the spirit, both of the joints and the marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So here we see two different references with the word of God and the truth. And so we know the truth. The truth will set us free. Uh, The word corrects us, aligns us. In John 1.1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Um, And then it goes on, I believe, in verse 12, where he says, and the the Word uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is the Word? Jesus. And he says, if you continue in my Word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Look at our last verse this morning, John 14, 6. Then it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How many ways are there? One One way. Through Jesus. The word of life, he is the truth. Amen? Amen. The enemy does not want us to walk in the truth. He wants us to walk in a lie as he is the father of lies. Because you'll see a lot of people in this world walk in a lie. Um, and, and they don't know that one plus one is two. And so we need to know the truth and that truth sets us free. For all of us in here, the enemy tries to, with different things, tries to trap people. It, it's interesting, the... Uh, I always thought this was interesting in the beginning. We don't see it much anymore, but you'd see on the computer, WWW, which stands for the World Wide Web. Isn't that interesting? A web is to trap. And so we see that even now so many people are trapped by the World Wide Web because it is those things that seems to raise up a wall of things of the flesh that keeps us from fully committing ourselves to the Lord. So, for all of us, we have that ability to let our guard down. And so, I'm speaking to myself too. Boy, we need to make sure that we are fully committed to the Lord. If I am filled with the Spirit, I'll be led by the Spirit. If I'm doubly minded, the Bible says I'm not good for anything. I can't eat all the Texas junk food and get a Diet Pepsi and think that cancels it out. Right? Right? I I can't live like hell on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, go to church on Sunday and expect that it's going to cancel out. It doesn't, doesn't work. And so every day I need to make sure I'm aligned with the will of God. Amen. If you take out your communion with me today, again, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets in his life. The reference of the land of Egypt is uh, the land of sin. And the people of Israel were in bondage. They were in sin. They were in slavery. And they had a master that kept them down. And so the Lord sends a deliverer in Moses 
to let his people go. And at one of the plagues that took place, we know that the death angel was going to come and so the instruction was given to get the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost. And as you put the, the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, the angel would pass over and you'd be saved. And so it was a reference to the blood of the lamb, Jesus, who would take away our sins. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he says, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was that lamb. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the truth. <laughs> Jesus is the life. The enemy wants to rob from you, steal from you, destroy you. And that's why we can't allow him to have that partition up in our minds. We got to be fully dedicated to the Lord so we can walk in the spirit and not in the flesh because our flesh is very, very weak. When we don't have the flesh, we're going to be really, really spiritual. <laughs> How many of you will be glad for that day? We don't have to battle every day against the flesh. I am very spiritual every day until I wake up and put my first foot on the ground. <laughs> then I'm susceptible. While I'm sleeping, I'm usually pretty good. <laughs> but we are to live in Christ, amen. And it reminds us that we are free because of what Jesus did on the cross. According to the law, we're condemned because none of us can follow the law, right? That's why we have 43 prisons in California because people can't follow the law. That's why when I see you driving on the freeway and it says 65, you guys are going 75, 80. It says 70, who knows what you're going, right? <laughs> and so it's a tendency in our lives not to follow the law. <laughs> Jesus fulfilled the law. Thank the Lord. And we must believe in him. God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness is upon us. We have to receive it by faith. That everything that Jesus accomplished on the cross, his body was broken, that we could be whole. He says, this cup represents the blood of my new covenant that we are covered in. He took the bread took it, he broke it, he blessed it, he passed it out. And then he gave us the cup, symbolizing our forgiveness, the remission of our sins because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Lord, for your word that is so powerful. Lord, help us all not to have a diet faith, but Lord, that we would have an everyday faith. Lord, that we would take the wall of our mind down to not have any partition. And Lord, if there's anyone who's battling with that mind, Lord, I pray that you give them the ability to take their thoughts captive to the obedience of you, Lord Jesus. Not to ponder on evil things, but to ponder on the spirit, everything that is good and pure and a good report. Lord, help us all. We know that the enemy of our soul his time is short and he's after so many people and marriages and lives and trying to get as many people in bondage and slavery to sin as he can. Lord, help us to absorb your truth and your word. Oh Lord, help us to abide in you each and every day. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you, thank you, thank you for setting us free, Lord Jesus. One day we'll know the power of that freedom. Give us the strength, the battle. Lord, give us the strength not to let our guard down and let the flesh creep in. Help us to take our thoughts captive, Lord, and, and help us, Lord, to be fully dedicated to you. We love you and thank you. Your word says, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of what you did upon the cross of Calvary. And symbolically, as we receive it, we receive.
the message and everything that it's related to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and receive it. If we could sing that song again. Would you stand with me? And let's go out singing this worship song that is powerful because of the blood of the Lamb. God bless you.